Feels like you Tell me pull up on, pull up on ya Nah, that I want, I want ya Put it on me, I put it on ya Gotta check on me Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage, Joe Spesic. All right. Thank you. Thank you for joining. So I'm Joe Spesak. I'm the product manager for PyTorch at Facebook. I could use the clicker. That would help. And I'm joined by my esteemed colleague, uh, Dima, who is more famous and being asked for selfies, uh, certainly, than I am. But glad to have Dima, and he'll come up and talk uh, shortly here. So we're here, about, uh, we're here to talk about developing and scaling uh, AI with PyTorch. So who's a user of PyTorch? OK, who loves PyTorch? Who really loves PyTorch? OK, because good. I love PyTorch, too. Uh, it's, uh, it's a passion project, honestly, for me. It's, uh, it's, it's all about open source, it's all about open, it's all about building community. Uh, and the, the stories that drive PyTorch, the usage and research. Um, you know, we have Jeremy Howard here sitting in the, in the front audience. No, you know, no person here teaches more people, I think, in the world AI than Jeremy, which is amazing. So, uh, agenda-wise, uh, I'll talk uh, briefly about AI at Facebook, uh, how we apply it, the scale which, which we run at. We'll then dive into PyTorch itself, uh, give an overview of kind of what it is. I will dive into a little bit of code. It won't be exciting code for anyone who's an actual PyTorch user, but uh, it's meant to be representative of really the kind of progression that. Uh, a user would go through to define a neural network, um, define parameters, and then actually train it. Um, and it, like I said, it's not, it's not sexy code, but, it's, um, but we will dive into a bit of code, uh, and then live actually later on. Uh, and then on, uh, Dimitro will come up here and talk about PyTorch at Facebook and talk about really the, the production challenges we're dealing with, really that research to production flow, uh, how we accomplish that, really some of the use cases that we've shipped uh, and the scale that we run it. Uh, for some of those. And then I will reappear uh, for the last part and talk about some of the tools and resources uh, for developers, so things like educational uh, platforms, uh, new tooling around PyTorch, uh, and actually show you guys a demo. So let's jump into it. So I think you've probably seen some of these if you caught you know, Shrep's keynote uh, and some of the talks yesterday uh, by, for example, Aparna and Lynn on the mobile side. Uh, you know, translation, you know, six billion translations a day, uh, augmented reality, uh, hand tracking with virtual reality, blood donations. These are all kind of representative applications uh, that apply a number of different types of AI. So computer vision, natural language processing, um, and in a lot of cases actually combine them. And we do run this in, in a lot of other applications at really large scale. And you've seen the statistic, maybe, maybe not, but you know, if you look at back at what Shrep's keynote was last year, last year's F8, so kind of year over year, uh, I think his keynote uh, said something like 200 trillion. So year over year, now we're at 400. So we're growing. So we've actually, uh, you know, the number is, is doubled uh, F8 over F8, which is uh, pretty incredible. And then, of course, uh, you know, again, in Aparna and Lynn's talk yesterday, they talked about mobile and kind of building a mobile AI platform. And, you know, with a billion phones running neural nets, and this isn't just starting today. This has been like this for the last several years, doing things like you know, AI camera, uh, things like uh, style transfer, uh, and so on. So it's, it's pretty incredible the scale that we run at, and that allows us to, to do a lot of things and, and actually have a, a, a lot of impact with the, the code that we actually develop. So I wanted to start with kind of a timeline around PyTorch to give uh, a few folks a bit of history on the platform. Uh, because we didn't just uh, arrive at 1.0. It was, it was a long, arduous journey to get there. Uh, I've personally been on this project for now uh, a year and a half. Uh, prior to that, doing other things, uh, still in open source and AI. And uh, it's been a long year and a half, uh, a great year and a half. Uh, today, we're excited that you know, we're looking at a PyTorch 1.0 that's actually shipping in production. So we're actually be able to take you know, real cutting edge research, take it through the production workflow, ship it at really large scale. Uh, and this is actually not just at Facebook, but really echoed externally. Uh, and if you catch the next session here at 1 o'clock, uh, my colleague, actually my skip manager, Jerome Pacente, uh, our VP of AI, will actually introduce that. We'll have a number of our partners like Airbnb, Toyota, Microsoft, uh, talk about how they're actually doing the same thing and scaling up uh, PyTorch. But I, I promised you a history lesson, a brief one. So walking backwards, um, kind of in the, you know, the, the before days, the history, uh, you know, the, the prior to PyTorch days, we had something called Lua Torch. Has anybody heard of Lua Torch? 
Has anyone actually written Lua? Okay, Jeremy, you don't count. <laughs> Uh, so Lua Torch was actually very similar to PyTorch in a lot of ways. It was imperative, it was uh, kind of interactive. Frankly, no one liked writing Lua though, uh, and it wasn't really plugged into uh, this great ecosystem and, and, uh, and set of packages that, for example, Python has. But it was very focused on research, a lot of research. In fact, we still get people uh, publishing and using uh, the original like Lua Torch, I think it was uh, Torch 7 these days, and um, there's still uh, a small community out there using it. Fast forward to you know, roughly the middle of uh, 2016, uh, we open sourced uh, a project that was su successor of the UC Berkeley uh, Project Cafe called Cafe 2. Uh, and this was all about production. So we needed scale, we needed stability, we needed performance. Uh, when I say scale, we needed to, to scale down to mobile devices into the hundreds of you know, kilobytes to uh, have a uh, resident runtime on say a Android, low end Android phone. Uh, and that was kind of our workhorse for production. But frankly, it wasn't the easiest to program, uh, wasn't really the best user experience. Uh, researchers, frankly, didn't like it. Uh, and so fast forward another six months and PyTorch came about. So PyTorch really was the successor of the Lua Torch project. It, was, it had shared a lot of the same values, uh, you know, the imperative interactive uh, front end, uh, the JIT, there was a just-in-time compiler, uh, people forget, uh, in Lua. Um, and so it, it, but it was Pythonic, which meant you, know, you can actually pair it with a lot of the, the nice libraries that are out there. So if anyone's familiar with NumPy uh, or Spacey or all these other great projects like Pandas where it can just use them inter, uh, interchangeably or in, in the same program and it's just this, it's all Python, it's great. Uh, it's expressive, you can express any idea you want, uh, it's intuitive um, and it's really clean code uh, if you actually you know, read through it and it gives you kind of an intuition uh, about what's going on. Uh, and then year over year, we partnered uh, with, for example, Microsoft and Amazon to create something called Onyx. And the, the goal of Onyx was, man, we have these two frameworks. We have one that's really stable, really performant, called Cafe 2, that's uh, running at large scale. Uh, we have this you know, beautiful Pythonic uh, framework called PyTorch Now that researchers adore. They love it. They're publishing. Uh, we see cutting edge research coming out. Uh, it's still really young, it's still really early days, but we see a great ecosystem and a lot, of, uh, a lot of code coming, but how do we actually take that code into production? That's where Onyx came in. So that became the language for us to, to really bridge those two worlds. Um, and as a side effect, this created this great ecosystem uh, led by you know, the three companies here, but lots, lots of others, literally dozens of others. Uh, and then in May of 2018, so really last F8, Shrub got up on stage and announced our unification day and uh, we decided to uh, you know, go down the single platform, research to production, uh, coalesce everything around one single platform called PyTorch One. And then actually delivered that in December 18, if anyone was at NRIPS uh, last year, we uh, announced that at a, a workshop there, and that was really a unified code base, one single platform, uh, a finished product by no means, uh, but, but our first stable release. And then back to today where we have a, a single platform uh, that is now uh, shipping. So what is PyTorch? So PyTorch starts with this eager, this, this concept of an eager front end, which is really defined by run. So I can write Python code, I can execute it, and it will actually define and, and execute a graph and create a graph on the fly. But as we mentioned, we actually need to get to a production system, and that actually requires typically some type of static graph, some type of, uh, of some, something that I can execute trillions of times over. And that's how uh, Dima actually is gonna talk about this uh, later on. But really, how do I get from this nice Pythonic, uh, you know, open world uh, front end into something that I can then uh, ship in large scale? Uh, secondly, it's dynamic. So again, like if I wanna pop in a different layer, uh, I don't have to do many kind of meta programming and to find this, this kind of you know, static kind of uh, graph that I, I have to go compile and then if I change anything or I want to try and debug it, it's, it's, it's you know, incredibly difficult. Uh, I can actually just use my Python debugger. I can add, add a different layer if I want to or change parameters uh, very quickly. Uh, it's also great for things like control flow in applications uh, like NLP. Uh, distributed training has become more and more important for us. If anyone's familiar with like the transformer models these days, those, that architecture is uh, kind of taking uh, language modeling by storm uh, and it's, it's you know, right now, uh, those models are, are very accurate, but they're also very expensive size-wise as well as 
um, you know, an overall parameter count. Uh, we see them approaching you know, sometimes a billion or close to a billion parameters uh, for the, some of the more cutting edge ones. Uh, and then hardware accelerated inference. Uh, if anybody's seen some of our talks at OCP a few weeks back or uh, roughly, I guess, a month ago, you know, you've seen that data center power is actually doubling year over year. Uh, this isn't sustainable. So we are investing in supporting things like the cloud TPUs with Google uh, and our own hardware, uh, as well as a, a partner ecosystem of hardware. And then really lastly, simplicity over complexity. If you look at PyTorch itself, it's a very elegant API. There's typically one way to do things and it's an easy and, and clean way to do it. Uh, there's not really, you know, you don't have to choose between five different uh, types of, of APIs. So that's really endeared uh, PyTorch to a lot of developers, to researchers. Uh, they don't have to guess or, uh, or figure out how to do things. It's just, it's very intuitive. So when you look at PyTorch itself, uh, it's actually made up of uh, a lot of subclasses uh, as well as a number of utilities and libraries. So starting with, for example, the torch.nn uh, library, which is, you know, along with the JIT and the, you know, the just-in-time compiler is really the, 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 the beating heart of, of any uh, new algorithm where I'm defining layers of my network um, and then I want to be able to trace and, and script those, uh, those layers and actually to create a deployable algorithm. And then there's things like Autograd, of course, because no one likes to write um, you know, the, the algorithms to, to do differentiation. I think that's something that I think I learned from Jeremy, actually, uh, in, his, in his class a long time ago. It's very painful to write that in NumPy. And, and it's actually much nicer to say you know, loss.backward in PyTorch and have everything all done for me. Uh, and then a, a number of really nice uh, libraries, so things like Torch Vision, which gives you data sets and models, uh, and then Torch.data for things like data loading. So what does this actually look like? And again, fair warning, this is very simple code, but it gives you an idea of what a representative uh, model looks like. So I'm defining uh, my neural net here, um, and it's, a, it's not a very exciting one, but it's two linear layers, two fully connected layers. Uh, but I do have some boilerplate code, so I'm importing Torch, that's how I actually uh, get my library uh, imported. Uh, I define a class called net, which is gonna be what my neural network uh, is called. I subclass that on nn.module, uh, which allows me to use these linear layers, and then I define some parameters. Uh, I then define the forward method, and all this does is really take that network that I define, those, those parameters that I wanna go learn, uh, and it introduces some things like nonlinear functions, so I'm doing a rectified linear unit, uh, I'm adding some uh, dropout for regularization with a probability of 0.5 as I wanna uh, turn on and off neurons, and then I have some output uh, function, uh, which is a sigmoid on my last layer to output a probability. And that's really my forward method. Once I have those defined, um, I can actually start loading data. So I'm loading the MNIST data set out of Torch Vision. Again, like one line of code, and I get a nice data set preloaded for me. Uh, I find my optimizer from the torch.optim library, in this case, uh, stochastic gradient descent. Uh, and I'm kind of off and running here. I can now uh, define a training loop. And so here's what a training loop looks, looks like. It's uh, very simple, so it's a for loop. Uh, with an embedded for loop. And uh, so a few, few things on terminology. So when you train a neural network, there's typically three things that happen. You propagate forward, you propagate backwards, uh, and then you do an update. And so what I'm doing is actually uh, 11 um, epochs here, uh, which is an iteration uh, over the data set. Um, and I'm starting out doing a, a zero, so I'm zeroing out my gradients. Uh, I'm doing a forward, so you see prediction um, equals net dot forward. Uh, I'm defining my loss, in this case a negative, negative log likelihood loss, and I do a loss dot backwards, which is beautiful because it just calculates all my gradients for me, and then I take a step, um, and then I rinse repeat and do that um, until I feel like I've converged or I want to save my model, and in this case I'm doing a torch dot save, and that actually gives me a model that I can then run new predictions on. Um, and there will be a demo later on of actually showing new predictions. So, Getting back to our timeline for a second. So we have PyTorch 1 today. It's actually shipping in production. We have a C++ API for a number of uh, performance critical applications. Uh, reinforcement learning for one has been really critical um, for us and, and they've loved having a C++ API. Uh, we've added CPU performance. We've also revamped the distributed backend for it. Uh, as I mentioned, distributed training is really important for these larger scale models. Not only for, for sharding data, but also actually sharding the model itself over multiple uh, devices. And today we've also announced uh, in the release, in the 1.1 release that went out last night and it was in the blog post this morning, TensorBoard support. So now you can actually start to visualize all these things, it's beautiful. Uh, you can show your loss curves and I'll show you those later. 
I can show you embeddings uh, and all that. So it's, it's really fantastic from a user perspective. Lots of great tools. Okay, so what's forward? As we kind of look forward here, what, what, what's coming? So quantization. So one of the interesting things about deep learning that we've learned over the last several years is uh, it's actually pretty resilient to loss of uh, accuracy or, or lower accuracy. So typically, you know, in, in the early days of deep learning, everything was kind of done in single precision or float 32. Uh, you know, lots of accuracy, lots of mantissibits. Uh, that was great. Uh, but we, we, you know, with research, we found that hey, we can go down to things like 16-bit floating point or even integer type of uh, computations and actually still get great accuracy. So what's coming? So things like low precision inference, uh, post-training quantization. So if I have a trained model and I want to quantize it and then take advantages of the maybe new Intel CPUs that have 8-bit uh, integer computations, um, that's great. And then quantization-aware training or something typically called fake quantization where I'm gathering statistics. Uh, I'm still doing maybe a training in standard single precision, but I'm gathering statistics uh, for what low precision would look like uh, while I'm training so I can apply those later on to inference. And so we found actually that has been incredible for us. It, it, it really allows us to scale up our compute and take advantage of more of the compute available um, as well as uh, be more compact from a memory standpoint. Eight bits obviously are much nicer than 32. So, so what else? Uh, front end API, so things like name tensors. I know this is kind of an interesting thing. So if anyone gets a chance to uh, look up Sasha Rush over at Harvard, he wrote a great blog post and wrote a paper a few months back on named tensors. So how do I actually name the dimensions of my tensor instead of having to comment uh, uh, within my code and comments get stale uh, and it's really kind of not very intuitive from a user perspective. Uh, also transformers, so having uh, a nice front end API for nn.transformers is coming and self attention. Also domain API, so we mentioned Torch Vision and how to use that. Uh, we are working on a number of updates to uh, Torch Vision, Torch Text and Torch Audio. These will bring state-of-the-art models, uh, data sets, loaders, and a lot of new transformations uh, for users, for, mainly for you know, researchers to, to really you know, get a baseline quickly. So for example, if I'm creating a new computer vision algorithm, I'd like to baseline you know, what is the state-of-the-art today. That gives me an accuracy, and then I can uh, kind of do a very quick comparison without having to go through a lot of uh, overhead to actually create uh, you know, and, and actually define that network, train it, all that. It's actually just ready for the researcher right there. So I'm gonna hand it off now to Dima, uh, who's gonna talk about PyTorch at Facebook. Thank you, Joe. Hi, so my name is Dimitro, or Dima, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we use PyTorch to bridge research and production at Facebook and walk you through, through some applications. So if you look in general, uh, advances in AI are driven by innovative research, either in academia or industry. And historically, there's been a big lag between research and production. The thing is like, if you have a new idea and you want to take it all the way through to deployment, you usually need to go through multiple steps. First, you need to figure out what your approach is and find the training data, maybe prepare, massage it a little bit, actually build and train your model after that. And then there is this painful step of transferring your model to production environment, which often historically involved re-implementation uh, of a lot of code. So you can actually take and deploy it and scale up. And taking the idea all the way through, through the steps, can easily take weeks or even months. And as we depend more and more on AI, deploying fresher models often becomes business critical. For example, to address challenges such as content moderation or healthcare, accessibility, security, etc. So that's why we really believe that by minimizing this gap, we can encourage advances, kind of advances in the field and experimentations to happen faster and allow like newer and more precise systems which appear kind of in research environments to be brought, you know, brought into production in a matter of days instead of months. And this has been a major theme for PyTorch 1.0 over the past year. So when we talk about bringing to production, what does it actually mean? Usually there are several kind of classes of challenges associated with it. First of them is hardware efficiency. So in many environments, there are very tight latency constraints, so you really need to fit into that performance budget. Also, if you're running at large scale and you're underutilizing your hardware, often it can lead to increased costs, so you want to squeeze last bits of performance pretty much on whatever platform you're running on. Related to that is uh, scalability. So in training, it usually means uh, running on huge data sets. For example, in some of the recent work uh, which we've been talking about uh, during today's keynote, we like trained on 
billions of public images and show that like ac uh, significant accuracy gains or the state of the art compared to like regular data sets such as ImageNet, which are usually in, uh, rank in millions. And similarly, if you take models to inference, usually it means running billions of inferences per second with multiple diverse models sharing the same hardware. Platform constraints are also a factor. So neural network models often are not isolated thin and need to be deployed just inside their target application with a lot of interdependence with the surrounding code. And application can, or like service can pose different constraints on it. For example, you might not be able to run Python or you, need, you have only very constrained compute capabilities if you're running a mobile device uh, and you need to utilize those capabilities optimally. Last but not least is reliability, because a lot of these jobs uh, run for multiple weeks on hundreds of GPUs. And it's important to design reliable software which can tolerate hardware failures and basically get the job done and deliver results. So how do we approach these uh, challenges with PyTorch 1.0? In order to actually tackle the challenges listed above, uh, we need to build the systems which can take your training job and basically do a bunch of optimizations focused on performance for the performance critical pieces and also apply recipes for reliability. In order to do that, it often requires to be able to transform automatically the modeling code which developer writes. That's why the key factor in this is uh, torch.jet package, uh, which, is, uh, which is built to capture the structure of your PyTorch program with minimal changes to the code, the source code, and apply optimizations pretty much behind your back. Uh, the goal of JET is basically to make this process mostly seamless. So how does it work? Uh, we believe in flexibility of regular programming paradigm, and actually what PyTorch has been so successful is mostly to, to the fact that it feels like regular programming in Python. And we believe that most of the users will start developing in traditional PyTorch mode, so-called eager mode, just by writing and prototyping their programs. For the subset of promising models which uh, show, show good results and you, which you need to productionize to scale up, you can apply uh, techniques provided by JIT uh, to take this experimental code and uh, annotate it in order to run a so-called Torch script code. This is really like a subset of Python which has slightly stricter semantics but allows us to apply transformations uh, pretty much uh, transparently for the, uh, to the user. Adding those annotations is usually just adding a few lines of Python code on top of your function. And uh, it's designed in such a way that it can be done incrementally on function by function or module by module level. Uh, by mixing kind of two approaches in a hybrid, a hybrid uh, fashion, you, you can effectively do this incrementally and still make sure that your model works along the way. Once you get to Torch script representations, there are multiple optimizations which we can do. For example, we can take your entire model and compile it to the target hardware to basically generate machine code to run efficiently on specialized accelerators such as TPUs or other hardware. Or we can take the model and pretty much run it without Python environments, let's say on embedded device or in some constrained environments. What we've seen internally is that, um, that this kind of these tools provided by TorchScript are really powerful and allow teams to share the same code base between research and production environments. Common pattern which we see is that there would be like a bunch of folks more like on research side and more on production oriented teams, which would share the same code base built on top of PyTorch, which targets particular domain, such as text classification or object detection, or maybe like reinforcement learning. And they would prototype new models, new training algorithms, address new tasks, and quickly transition this functionality to production environment. Let's see some of the examples of that. One of them is PyText framework for text understanding and its usages in M suggestions. M is helping users on Messenger uh, to achieve tasks faster by showing smart suggestions for different actions and quick replies during conversations. As you might imagine, uh, M needs to run in real time and we have billions of Messenger conversations per day, so the scale is also pretty important, as well as challenges with multiple diverse languages with different modeling needs. Let's take a look how a team utilizes PyText to solve those tasks and iterate quickly. Let's say you have a new idea or maybe there is some paper came out which you might want to try. Uh, PyText provides you common building blocks for typical tasks for text understanding, such as parsing preparing training data, common models used in NLP, evaluation setups, etc. PyText is designed to be modular, so you need to be only concerned with that component of the model which you're modifying at this moment, and the rest of the components should just fall in place and uh, work smoothly. 
Since it's built on PyTorch, it's actually pretty easy to prototype and build new implementation of different modules. Once you have some particular mod PyTorch model which you might want to tr uh, try on large scale, uh, you, we have a small service where we can run it on Python environment pretty much without any constraints on flexibility, so if you want to use crazy library, you can. And it still serve small amount of real traffic. Uh, if, you, uh, if you're happy with small scale metrics results, you can basically convert this model to Torch script and maybe iterate a little bit on production, uh, production scale and challenges so you can uh, run it at scale and deploy it to large scale C++ service which actually handles all the traffic or in some cases deploy it directly to device if encryption or user experience constraints basically require uh, inference directly on the device. There are other, like, multiple platforms which people build on top of PyTorch. Another example which I want to talk about is uh, Botorch, which is a package for Bayesian optimization, uh, which, uh, which gets released uh, today, actually, and uh, adaptive experimentation framework called X built on top of it. So why would you want to use Bayesian optimization? One common example where it's actually extremely useful is so-called hyperparameter optimization. If you look at training any AI models, there are often a lot of magic numbers uh, the modeling author needs to pick in order to train to a good accuracy. For example, learning rate or weight decay. Take an example of the learning rate. If your learning rate is too low, then your model will be converging slowly and probably will not capture on the information in the data. If you get learning rate too high, it probably just overfit to the first few, like, first few chunks of data it sees and stop learning after that. Or if you get it too high, it might actually not converge at all. You really, you really need to like get this number pretty much precise. And historically, picking those numbers has been like trial and error process, or maybe like just trying to do some grid search. With Bayesian optimization in Botorch, you can actually do it more effectively and automate this discovery process, so you can find the right hyperparameters with really small number of experiments saving your compute resources. It's pretty much easy to construct the model. Just point the optimization toolkit on it, push the button, and get good values out of it. So Botorch itself provides implementations of underlying modeling technique, like Gaussian processes, common training approaches for that, evaluation setups, and all the surrounding infrastructure. Since it's built on PyTorch, it utilizes the same highly performant numerical libraries uh, to carry out the computations. As a layer on top, uh, team also built adaptive experimentation framework called X, uh, which is ready to use toolkit, which you can bring to actual products and uh, kind of utilize it to understand, manage, deploy, and automate different experiments. As an example for that, uh, let's consider Newsfeed. Uh, in Facebook Newsfeed, we ran content using a variety of signals uh, that are combined together using a set of rules called configuration policy. Because of systems complex dynamic and user behavior involved, uh, policy search to improve user experience can be done only online through A-B tests. Uh, of course, offline simulation would be preferable because it has higher throughput. However, while the system is relatively easy to implement, it fails to capture all the interactions with real user, I I real user behavior dynamics. Ultimately, offline simulation itself can't be used as a replacement for online experiments. What adaptive experimentation allows you to do is to combine a small number of uh, online tests, like on, uh, on real user traffic, and a large number of approximate but much cheaper offline tests into a single model. Such approach effectively learns to correct the simulator error and borrows trends from the offline test to make accurate online predictions. And in fact, we applied it to uh, good gains for the user experience in Newsfeed. I'm very excited to announce that we actually open sourced both Botorch and X today. And if you want to learn more, there's gonna be a talk later today by Ethan and Kostya who are gonna walk through details of that. And in fact, open sourcing is just a continuation of a broader theme. One of the really cool things which we do at Facebook is to open source a lot of kind of production tested code in the form of libraries and frameworks. Those are usually battle prone and often very close to their stuff which we run internally at, at, at large scale. Other platforms which I mentioned before today, such as Translate, FireSeq for, uh, for machine translation, Pytex for text understanding, or Horizon for reinforcement learning, and ma many others, are also open source and have healthy communities around them. And obviously, PyTorch itself is open source and have a great community. And I'm gonna go, uh, I'm gonna hand it back to Joe, who is gonna talk about it in more details. You go first. 
Thanks, Dima. Okay, so I'm gonna uh, jump into the tools and resources here, kind of piggybacking on the last slide from Dima. So, you know, I'm personally excited about how we open source a lot of our production libraries. I think this is a great way for us as Facebook to contribute back to this great community of PyTorch. But one thing that's really interesting that we found is PyTorch is actually really growing. So if anybody has seen this stat, um, you know, if you look at GitHub as a whole, there's literally thousands of projects. Right now, PyTorch, based on number of contributors and overall usage, is now the second fastest growing project, not just framework, but all up on GitHub, which is really exciting. I think we're actually just behind Azure Docs, so if anybody from Microsoft is, is here, I don't know, you guys didn't have number one, but, but we're really excited about that. Uh, second thing I'd say is we have some great books, some, some great learning materials, so if anybody knows Dilip Rao, um, he wrote a book uh, for natural language processing that's out now. Uh, as well as uh, Eli Stevens and Luca Antiga, uh, who's based out of Italy, wrote a, a book on deep learning uh, for PyTorch. Uh, and these are both out and available uh, and great resources uh, for you to learn from. We also have a rabid community. Um, and you, know, you can see maybe uh, this gentleman up here on the, the far upper left, uh, sitting in the front row here, but we have a lot of, of really um, great passion um, in the community around PyTorch. So Alfredo uh, over in, in the East Coast and NYU, uh, he just, uh, because of the love of, of PyTorch, he just teaches classes. He creates classes, courses, and actually goes around and, uh, and educates uh, the community. It's really exciting. Uh, Stephen Merity as well, uh, who is now a startup founder, but previously at Salesforce. And then taking a step back and looking at kind of everything that we do uh, in open source. So down to the hardware, we talked about OCP and, and the open compute platform and things like Zion, which is our new accelerator hardware platform that we open source that we're planning to use inside of Facebook uh, to our compilers, which are also open source. So compilers these days are, are, are very sexy. Everyone loves compilers. There's a new compiler uh, popping up all the time. We are investing heavily into Glow. That's our future for our data center. Uh, as well as the Apache TVM project, which we find is an amazing project, and we, we do contribute to it, um, as well as, of course, the PyTorch is a framework uh, at the user level. But then to Dima's point, there's a number of these libraries that we open source. So Horizon, for example, for large-scale reinforcement learning, uh, you know, PyTex for NLP, to the models and to the data sets we open source uh, in order to collaborate uh, with the academic and research community. And a lot of these end up in the ecosystem. So you can go to pytorch.org, you can check out the, the ecosystem projects. Uh, we hold a very high bar on these projects, uh, and these are, these are well tested with PyTorch. Uh, Allen NLP, another one uh, for NLP research from Allen Institute of AI, uh, to our ELF Open Go uh, project, which was built for large scale reinforcement learning and uh, um, for game research. Uh, and so it's a really great resource from anything from uh, really the, the application uh, level of research all the way through to things like compilers and, and kernel libraries. So I highly recommend that. And then looking at the ecosystem itself around PyTorch, uh, we have a lot of leading developers, uh, uh, excuse me, leading adopters. Uh, and you actually learn about those at one o'clock here in the next session. But companies like Toyota, companies like you know, Tesla, who just talked about their autonomous driving platform, they're heavy users of PyTorch. Uh, that is their framework. Uh, they're, they're betting on it just like we are, which is really exciting. There's also uh, our cloud provider friends, so Amazon, Microsoft, Google. Uh, they invest themselves. They, they support PyTorch strongly in their platforms. You can easily onboard, uh, for example, in Amazon SageMaker or Azure ML or Azure Notebooks. And then in research, so universities uh, like Berkeley, Caltech, and, and so on. I'll talk more about those here. So, for example, at UC Berkeley, Alyosha Efros uh, and Jachenda Malik, who's also at Facebook, uh, teach using uh, PyTorch for their computer vision classes. Uh, Caltech, who's known for robotics, so they're definitely synonymous with robotics, uh, use PyTorch as their, their framework for their CAS lab, so they're for their Center of Autonomous Systems and Technology. The perception uh, algorithms they use are all developed using PyTorch. Stanford, if anyone's heard of Chris Manning in their NLP lab there, uh, he teaches his classes using PyTorch. And of course, our own Jan LeCun and the NYU uh, folks over there uh, also use it. And just a few images of the, the Caltech folks. So if anybody has seen the, the orange robot from Caltech, uh, that's Cassie. Uh, I'm lucky enough to have a lot of friends at Caltech, so I get to, to pop down there and hang out with their robotics team. 
that's Aaron Ames, uh, who actually does all of the, the more physical research. So he, he's investigating things like battery technology and um, you know, thermodynamics and uh, mechanical engineering, things that actually make the robot go versus the perception. And then he's paired with uh, researchers like Anima and Nan Kumar, uh, who's over here uh, to my left, as well as uh, at the bottom there, Yisong Yui. So they make a great team, uh, complement each other. And then looking at onboarding uh, for a second here, we mentioned Amazon, Microsoft, Google. Uh, they continue to bring out new, new platforms, uh, new services that offer PyTorch to developers in easier and better ways. Uh, one example, a few weeks back at uh, the Google Next uh, conference, we partnered closely with them to uh, launch what was called the AI Platform Notebooks uh, service, which is built on JupyterLab. So this is pretty nice. Uh, you can basically uh, click on a Jupyter, uh, excuse me, a notebook instance, which is based on Jupyter Lab, select PyTorch, uh, select a GPU, and now all of a sudden you have uh, this nice Jupyter environment um, that I can then annotate my code with a, a Python SDK uh, called Fairing in this case, and then I can then uh, deploy that to any number of different services. So it could be a, a, a Kubeflow pipeline, it could be in their cloud machine learning engine. So this is actually a really, really nice service. Uh, second thing uh, is, if anybody's familiar with TensorBoard, uh, I'll show actually more in, in, in a couple of slides here, but this is the embedding projector. So we're excited that TensorBoard is now, uh, has a first class support for PyTorch. Uh, this means that we landed code in both uh, Google's uh, TensorBoard repo as well as the PyTorch repo. This was a true collaboration. It, it requires um, you know, no TensorFlow dependency, uh, no dependencies really of any kind other than PyTorch. Uh, and you know, with a simple um, from import statement, you can actually start using this. And I'll talk about that. <laughs> Exciting, right? It's awesome. And then lastly, uh, around platforms, Colab. So who's used Colab, by the way? Okay, Colab's awesome. So free CPU, free GPU, Jupyter environment, like what could get better? So in this case, we, we also worked closely with uh, the team up there, especially Michael Pytech up in Seattle. And now basically, it's a simple import torch statement. There's no interstitial, uh, and you're often, basically you're off and running with a free GPU. Uh, it works great. All of our tutorials on pytorch.org have Colab support. You click on them, they automatically bring you to a Colab notebook, uh, and you can immediately get started, immediately get going, and start executing your code and really learning what it's, what it's doing. And this accelerates that learning process, it accelerates the, the you know, research, trying things out. Universities, top universities like Berkeley, for example, for computer vision are using this to teach. So it's really exciting. So I have a short video. Uh, I wanted to do this live, but the, uh, the F8 folks said probably safer to do a video. <laughs> cool, not a problem. So in this case, I'm doing, doing Fashion MNIST. So not the most exciting, uh, but it's actually pretty representative and it shows at least very simply uh, how to walk through, how to define a net, um, but, but most importantly, how to actually start to visualize things using TensorBoard. So um, I'm actually importing my packages here. So in this case, I'm importing Torch and Torch Vision. Um, I'm loading data. So again, a couple of lines of code uh, using uh, Torch Vision, and I have my data set loaded. It's really easy. I'm gonna generate embedding. So I'm basically gonna take all of that input data, um, which is high dimensional, and I'm actually gonna uh, push that down into a low dimension so I can actually uh, visualize that. Uh, I'm gonna log some random images. So, you know, in the case of Fashion MNIST, uh, these are the 28 by 28 grayscale uh, pictures of articles of clothing. So sandals, shoes, uh, shirts, et cetera. Uh, and so I wanna visualize what that data looks like. Uh, just like I talked about earlier, I'm gonna define my loss function, my optimizer, but then I'm also gonna add some code there so I can log my graph. So like I can actually see what the computational graph looks like, and then we can visualize that. Uh, and then I'm gonna actually train, just like I had my training loop earlier. Uh, in this case, my training, my model is slightly more complex. I'm actually using Lynette uh, as an homage to our chief uh, AI scientist, Jan LeCun. Um, I'm doing some things to actually visualize manually just to show you how painful it is to, to do this, and that's what those little, uh, that little matrix uh, is here, this little uh, couple of, uh, visualize uh, the, the class probability as well as the image. Um, the previous prediction wasn't great, but I did a few more and those came out pretty good. So that was a pair of pants. And I think the previous one was a sandal. And now here's where the real magic uh, happens. Let's visualize things in TensorBoard. Let's start it over. And so once this is loading, um, I can actually then see these, these little uh, 
topics show up in the top of the screen. So I have scalars, I have images, I have graphs, and I have uh, the projector. So I'll start out with the scalar. This is just feeding me information about the loss uh, based on my training. So I'm, I'm calculating loss from each epoch of our training uh, and generating a loss. I'm just graphing that to show that my loss is declining. Uh, I'm also visualizing images and then visualizing the graph itself. So this is actually the layers in my neural network. Uh, and you can see I'm able to click on that and I can see I have four nice linear layers. I can even dive into that layer and see what's going on. This shows me that my network is connected correctly. Uh, and of course, this is a very simple uh, network. When things get into the you know, hundreds to even potentially over a thousand layers and some of these more complex uh, neural nets, that becomes very handy for me to kind of debug what's going on. And then of course, uh, you know, the embedding uh, projector is really handy to, to kind of give me an idea of what my data is doing. And you can see, in this case, I'm doing some principal component analysis and uh, you can see it's clustering a lot of the, the common components like the shoes and the shirts together. So that's a quick run through on TensorBoard. I highly recommend checking that out and playing a little more with that. Okay, so we're gonna switch gears, we're talking education. So starting with Udacity. So Udacity has been a partner with, of ours uh, for uh, a long time now. We, uh, they're a user of PyTorch. Uh, if anybody's familiar with the class we launched last year in November, anybody taken the class by any chance? Okay, a few, few folks, sweet. So thousands of students have taken that class. It's been a really big hit. Uh, we had scholarships, so if you wanted to follow up and take a nano degree, that was uh, something that we supported and we, as part of the sponsorship. And it's been really incredible, the overall response. So I think we're excited to say we have more coming for you. So today we're gonna announce we have a new privacy and AI class, free, available. Uh, this, is, this is awesome. This is, if you're excited about the first class, this is a brand new class. You can, uh, learn about, for example, encryption in AI, which is a very hot topic. Uh, we're funding scholarships, in this case, 300 scholarships to continue your education, and there's a nano degree to follow uh, in the summer, so you can start now. Uh, it's, it's actually about half the classes in, in the free course, and then the nano degree uh, is the other half, so it's pretty exciting. And then if you saw the little Star Trek, uh, or so, sorry, the Star Wars uh, scrolling, those are all the classes that, that Udacity has, which is pretty incredible. Um, they, uh, I'll scroll back for a second. So just, just incredible, uh, I guess I missed it. Um, it's incredible how many other classes they have on PyTorch. And then fast.ai, of course we have Jeremy, we have Jason, we have Uri here uh, from fast.ai. They have incredible viewing numbers. So their YouTube uh, videos, I mean, over a million and a half minutes a month. They have uh, you know, tens of thousands of, of monthly video views. They have a global community. Uh, it's incredible uh, what Jeremy does. So it's not just the US, uh, it's literally, I think he has someone maybe short of Antarctica. Uh, he has you know, students on every continent. Uh, and they have their own communities uh, and it's a very organic, um, uh, just, you know, it's really organic. Like students, they fly in San Francisco, uh, it's all funded, it's free, there's no ads. Uh, he builds a library uh, along with his team um, and, it's, and, and people just, they, they learn, they, um, they, and they, they, they don't just do um, you know, play algorithms, they do cutting edge research, they do cutting edge um, you know, computer vision, et cetera. And you know, one thing that's exciting for us, and Jeremy's here again, uh, he's gonna talk about this later on in his classroom, but there is a new course coming. So deep learning from the foundations will be released in June. Uh, it'll be on PyTorch. There'll also be fast.ai audio and fast.ai vision that's coming. So, uh, we're excited to work with Jeremy. We're excited for his new class to come. Uh, we're excited uh, for him to continue his mission, which we, we truly believe in. So how do you get started? So if you go to pytorch.org, there's a, a number of ways to get started. Uh, you can, as we mentioned, you can use Colab. You can use now TensorBoard in Colab. You can get started in the cloud. You can use Amazon. You can use Microsoft. You can use Google. Uh, you can install locally. You can just you know, pip install on your Mac um, and start running this. It's very easy. Uh, we also have a great community, so check us out. So you can go to Facebook, you can go to Twitter. We have this amazing community that publishes papers, publishes code, publishes their models. Uh, it's, it's, it's actually just, it's fun to watch because every day I wake up and I see something new um, you know, on our page and, and on Twitter that, that people have done with PyTorch and it really gets me excited. And then lastly, join us on the show floor. So uh, we don't you know, have just any random people from Facebook hanging out at our booth. These are the core devs for the project. So these are the people that you can ask real questions to. Uh, they can walk you through code, they can uh, teach you, they can uh, kind of give you an update on the latest release. So come to our booth, check it out, um, and, uh, and talk to our, our, 
our team. It's, it is our core devs. So, and that's it. Thank you very much, and thank you for attending.